So it's time for us to turn to God's Word. Um, I would like you first today to turn to the book of Deuteronomy, of course, the last book of Moses. And I want you to please find Deuteronomy chapter 18, which will be the background for our study in Acts today. Danny's going to read to you Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 9, down to 19, and that is on page 223 if you're using the two Bibles. Thanks, Danny. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For the, Lord, er, for the one who does these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst. From your brethren, him shall you hear. According to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up from them a brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them, and, that, and all that I command. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. All right, let's thank God for his word and let's pray. Our gracious Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed a God who communicates, a God who has spoken, and that we are able, Lord, to trust in your word. So we pray uh, today for one another as we uh, read your word and as we study and listen to how uh, all your scriptures have led up to uh, the revelation of your wonderful Son, our Savior, the God-man, and we pray, Father, as we consider this today, that your Holy Spirit would, uh, would fill our hearts with him and that we would live for your honor and glory. And we pray in Jesus Christ, amen. All right, now, saints, uh, with that in the back of your mind, if you would please turn over to Acts chapter 7. We'll pick up where we have been, and that's on page 1261. And uh, we are talking about Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin. And so I want to pick up in verse 33 and read a couple of verses of what we had last week and then uh, continue down to uh, 41. So this is Stephen. Uh, we've talked about Abraham. We've talked about Joseph. Now he's talking about Moses. And I'll pick up where uh, Moses met the Lord <clears throat> at the burning bush. Acts 7.33, Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers. This is the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. 
Uh, so thanks be to God for his word. Uh, so like I said, here we are in front of the Sanhedrin. It's the Jewish High Council. They have Stephen uh, before them answering charges of blasphemy, uh, very serious charges. Blasphemy is a capital crime. In other words, uh, it's worthy of the death penalty. And our narrator has already said back in the last chapter that some of the synagogue goers in Jerusalem uh, conspired to have false witnesses testify about Stephen that he's constantly blaspheming Moses and God and the temple. Uh, so Stephen's facing a hostile audience. And actually it's pretty likely that the outcome of this gathering had already been determined before it even got started, uh, which is the same as uh, happened with the Lord himself. Okay, but anyway, Stephen is having his say. And we're able to see from the speech that we've had so far just how well Stephen understands the span of the, uh, what we call the history of redemption. Right? And, and the, um, the groundwork, as I said, for Jesus was laid long, long ago through the centuries of the history of God's chosen people. So in referring to Abraham's call by God you know, 2,000 years prior, uh, Stephen established a very important point that God is the sovereign mover. Right? He's the initiator of man's salvation. And we down here, we have to accept what he does. We don't give God our conditions uh, and say, you have to meet our conditions, right? And, and um, God is the one who plans salvation and is bringing it to pass. And then we had the story of Joseph, in which, again, we saw it's the hand of God at work ordering and arranging the chain of events uh, in order to save many souls alive. It's quite an amazing series of events in the story of Joseph, uh, what with him being hated by his brothers, sold away into slavery, and then uh, unbeknownst to his brothers, reaching the pinnacle of power in uh, Egypt, and then becoming the merciful savior of the very ones who had so uh, ill-treated him. Okay, and so then Stephen, after that, turned to Moses and his similar tale of being elbowed aside, pushed aside by his own people, uh, rejected even though he had their best interest at heart, but then decades later coming again in the power of the Lord God to save by signs and wonders in the heaven and on the earth and in the sea and on the dry land and hail and fire and blood and, and a mighty triumph over his foes, like the hymn says about Jesus. Okay, that's where we left off last week. The lessons are starting to pile up now for Stephen's hearers, He's saying, brothers and fathers, listen, you're missing it. You're missing the most important thing that has ever happened. Our whole history has led up to this point. Okay, Stephen is not at all blaspheming Moses. He actually wants his listeners to pay closer attention to Moses than they have been. What, what would Moses have to say to us today, brothers? Right? What did Moses uh, teach us? What, I'll tell you what he did say, Stephen says. Uh, so this is verse 37. Okay, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren, and you must listen to him. Okay, now you could hear Stephen asking them, what makes a good Jew? I would say a good Jew is somebody who listens to Moses, wouldn't you? Right, isn't Moses the one that God uh, sent to deliver his people from Egypt? Isn't Moses the one that God did these signs and wonders through? Didn't Moses receive revelation directly from God uh, for the nation of his chosen people? Okay, that's the next verse, 38, right? He's the one the angel of the Lord spoke with on the mountain. He's the one who received the, uh, the living oracles to give to us. Isn't that a fascinating turn of phrase, by the way? The living oracles of God, right? The, the words that God speaks are living, okay? It's like Hebrews says, the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, it penetrates right into the center of your soul and it lays you open, right? The words of God speak and they teach and they grow, they are alive, right? And Stephen says, God gave these living oracles to us through Moses. And Moses said, and we should obey him, right? Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me 
from your brethren, and you must listen to him. Right? The living oracles of God tell us that a prophet like Moses is going to be raised up by God, and whoever doesn't listen to him is going to be cut off from the people. So friends, we have to keep our focus on the one who is greater. Right? There are many uh, so-called great men in the Bible. Right? Prophets and priests and kings and apostles and warriors and wise men. Okay? You name your favorite ones. Who are the greatest ones in the Bible? King David, Elijah, uh, Moses, Isaiah, Peter. Right? Whoever they are, what would they say to you and me? They would say, not I, Christ. There exists someone greater than Solomon. There exists someone greater than Jonah. There's someone greater than the temple. Right? Moses was a great man, let's agree, a man worthy of honor, but he was not God's final savior, which that ought to, I think that ought to be pretty obvious that, God, that he was not God's final savior because if Moses' deliverance had been final, then we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now, would we? Right? First century Jews, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. Right? Still in need of salvation. Moses was a channel of God's word, obviously, certainly. But it was not God's final word. Right? And that is a very critical point for the Jews in this scene who are defending, uh, as it said in chapter 6, defending the customs that Moses handed down to us. Right, this man, Stephen, he's attacking the customs that Moses handed down to us. Well, all right, Moses did deliver us the word of God and the laws to keep, right? They came from God, and Moses delivered us the instructions for the tabernacle, which he received right from God, and the customs that are in the law. But all of that word of God was not God's final word. How do I know that? because Moses himself said so, right? It's right in the word of God in Deuteronomy. There's another one yet to come. So how do I know today that the new covenant is a valid thing? It's because the prophets of the old covenant said there was going to be a new covenant. You follow me? That's how I know. The appearance of Christianity in history as I've said, is not something that just sort of spontaneously uh, developed by itself. It's not just something that evolved out of a culture. It was specifically predicted and prepared for. Uh, so by way of contrast, uh, how do I know that the Mormon covenant, right, says in the title on the front cover of the Book of Mormon, another covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, how do I know that that covenant is completely bogus. Well, it's because there was never any indication that such a covenant would come. It wasn't promised by God. It wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It wasn't prepared for by any predictive prophecy or Old Testament symbolism. It is just a made-up story about a bunch of people who never lived and who never left us any records. It is a complete fantasy, and it is not worth a moment of our time. But as for Jesus, the entire body of the Hebrew Scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, anticipates him. Okay? Both in written words, things like, for unto us a child is born, and so on, but also in some of the individuals who prefigure the Lord Jesus. So, one like Moses, uh, a new David, a new Solomon, uh, a new Adam, Right? You take my meaning, a new Joseph, a new Boaz. Uh, Hebrews talks about Joshua. Right? Who's Joshua? He's the general who conquered, he led the conquest into the promised land. Okay, but Hebrews says, if Joshua had brought the Israelites rest, if he had brought the people into their rest, why does the scripture then later say uh, that people might or might not enter God's rest? Okay, if the conquest was the final victory and the tribes of Israel all received their inheritances, then why would the scripture say later, today if you hear God's voice, 
don't harden your hearts or you might not enter his rest. Okay, well, what do you mean? I thought we all entered our rest. Here we are, we're living in our... Okay, well, no, because Joshua was not the final guy, was he? Another generation arose that did not know Joshua, right? So another Joshua had to come. And name happens to also be Joshua, doesn't it? Right, Yeshua. Okay, he's the captain of our salvation. He's a new Joshua. Right, so Moses himself said to Israel, there's, if you like, another Moses yet to come. Now I want to ask you this. Did Jesus ever say, there's another one to come after me? No, not in your dreams. Right, did Jesus ever say, I'm not the one. Okay? Remember John the Baptist sending a couple of messengers to Jesus asking him, are you the one to come or should we wait for someone else? Right? Remember the woman at the well who said, uh, when the Messiah comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus answered, I who speak to you am he. Uh, you know how somebody, it's Cornelius later on in Acts, somebody came and knelt at Peter's feet and Peter said, don't do that, get up. I'm just a man like you. And, and John, when he saw the angel in Revelation, he you know, knelt down to, to worship at the angel's feet. The angel said, don't you do that, get up. I I'm, you know, I'm worship God alone. Okay? But when people came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, did he ever say, get up, don't stop, don't do that? Okay? Uh, when Caiaphas, when Jesus was on trial and Caiaphas ordered him, uh, to respond, he said, I adjure you, are you the son of the blessed one? Jesus answered, and this is from Mark, Jesus answered, I am, and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And because of that, they sentenced him to die. Okay? There is not a leg to stand on for anyone out there who says that Jesus never claimed to be what Christians worship him as. Okay, only a person who's ignorant of the scriptures could ever say a thing like that. He certainly did, and he received worship, and he knew that he was the prophet like Moses that the Lord God was going to raise up. Okay? And he said, I tell you, one greater than Solomon is here. One greater than the temple is here. Okay, so certainly we honor Moses. Right? Stephen and all the apostles, they honored Moses. Right? Peter, James, and John actually met him for a minute, didn't they? Okay? But to truly honor Moses is to pay attention to what he said. And, and remember that, that although Moses was great and he was greatly used of God, he was still just a man like the rest of us. Right? And he had his own sin. Uh, we're studying numbers in our evening services. It wasn't that long ago we read about how Moses was prohibited. He was denied entry into the promised land because of his failure. Right? Failed to honor God in the sight of the people when his temper got the best of him and he whacked the rock with this, his staff a couple of times. Right? He is a great hero of the faith, but he is not the perfect savior that we need. Okay, we need someone who is without sin of his own to spoil him. We need someone who always does his father's will with pleasure. And so Moses, in his farewell address in Deuteronomy, said to the Israelites, someone else is coming, and the Lord your God will raise him up. Now, of course, Jesus is like Moses in many ways. He's a shepherd. He's a guide through the wilderness. He is a man sent on a mission of salvation. He's a mediator between men and God. He's a righteous judge. He's a lawgiver. But I want you to compare, listen and compare how Jesus and Moses gave their laws. Moses says, these are the commandments and the statutes which the Lord your God has given you. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said of old, so on and so on, but I say unto you. Right, do you hear the difference? These are the commandments the Lord has given you. Jesus said, I say to you. Uh, Moses and Jesus both fed a hungry multitude in the desert. But listen to Moses ask God, where am I gonna get bread for all these people? 
And then you watch Jesus take five loaves and two fishes and say, thank you, Father, and then feed thousands of men and women and children uh, uh, with that and have 12 baskets left over. Okay? Moses received instructions about building a tabernacle, and when it was done, it was filled with the glory of the Lord. But in Jesus himself, the scripture says, the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Right? A, a temple not made by hands which he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He was speaking about his own body. Okay, so the similarities between Moses and Jesus, they are many. But Jesus is always the greater, right? He is the fulfillment of all the patterns and types which Moses was. And you could say that Jesus was a new Moses, or you could say Moses was a, like a prototype of Jesus. I am not God's final prophet. God will raise up one like me from among your brethren, and you must listen to him. Whoever does not will be cut off from the people. Now, unfortunately, you can't talk about uh, Israel in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses without thinking of all the grief the people put Moses through and all the times they rebelled against him. Right? Moses said, you are a stiff-necked and stubborn people. And when the Lord your God raises up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, you must obey him. You must listen to him. But unfortunately, that's just another aspect in which Jesus is like Moses. And the Israelites in his day were just like the Israelites in the old days. Right? They not only rejected him at first, which is what we had last week, you know, who made you a, a ruler and a judge, Okay, but they continued to reject him again and again even after he brought them out of Egypt. Okay, and we've been studying Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers over the years, and we keep having one after another of these stupefying episodes where we ask, you know, how could these people who themselves witnessed the ten plagues and themselves walked across the bottom of the Red Sea between two walls of water and themselves ate manna for breakfast every day and themselves live in the shadow of the pillar of cloud, how could these people have the nerve to reject and rebel against Moses. Well, so that's the rest of our text for today. At the end of verse 38, uh, Stephen says, uh, he's the one who received the living oracles to give to us. 39, though, whom our fathers would not obey, but they rejected him. Moses, what did you bring us out here for? You brought us out here to die, and on and on, okay? In their hearts, it says, they turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, right, listen to the sarcasm. Right, as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't even know what's become of him. Well, you know where Moses was? He was up on the top of the mountain getting you the Ten Commandments. That's what became of him. Okay, but listen to how sarcastic they are. And they made a calf, and they offered sacrifices to the idol, and they rejoiced in the works of their own hands. So even after all the signs and wonders that they had witnessed God do through Moses, they rebelled against God, they rebelled against Moses and said, let's make a new God for ourselves, a little animal God of all things. And they did that right at the base of Mount Sinai, where they themselves, less than six weeks ago, heard the very voice of God speaking to them from the top of the mountain. Okay, and it didn't stop there. Even after Moses came down the mountain and even after the golden calf was melted down and burned up and so on, the people complained again and again. When it was time to go up to the promised land, they said, we won't go. Let's choose a new leader and head back to Egypt. Right? Even after all the miracles Jesus performed, they still didn't believe him. Even after, uh, on the day of his execution, after the earthquake, after the sky went black, after the veil was torn down the middle in the temple, the Jewish leaders still hardened their hearts against Jesus. How many signs do you need to see? You know, and even though the, the apostles had been performing remarkable miracles all around Jerusalem now for weeks, probably months, preaching Jesus is risen indeed, and they're winning souls, and they still absolutely refuse to obey the gospel and be saved. How many wonders do you need to see? How much evidence do you have to have? Because in their hearts, they want the old way. 
We don't want this new Moses. We don't want this new word from God. We want to go back. Right? We had it better the old way. Right? They want the man-made temple, not the one uh, that's the, the, the indwelling of God, the one that's made without hands, made by the Holy Spirit, the temple which God is building. Okay? And we observers, if we're wise, you know, We'll say, like we said about the Old Testament Israelites, how can people who witness such things be so rebellious? Remember when Jesus said to Thomas, you know, you've seen and so you believe. Blessed are those who haven't seen and they still believe. Well, what about these who have seen and still don't believe? We're not that far away here from the end of the chapter where Stephen says, you're just as stiff-necked as your father's. It's not I, Stephen, whom rebellious. It's you, the Sanhedrin, who are rebellious and blasphemous, right? Your hearts are set against God, right? God once again has sent us a salvation. This is a new exodus. It's a new so-called, uh, a new uh, chosen people, right? He sent you a new redeemer. And the old redeemer, Moses, told you the new redeemer was coming, okay? And you say you honor Moses, but you don't pay attention to Moses. What would Moses say to you now? Wouldn't he judge you? Wouldn't he say, you foolish and slow of heart to believe my words? Okay, get up and be free and go be saved to follow your new shepherd. He's guiding you to your eternal home. Listen to his voice now. He must become greater, I must become less. Now this, saints, this is what we have to say to the world today. Jesus is the one who is greater than all. He is greater than any saint. He is greater than any holy place. He is greater than any prophet or priest or king. He's not just some fellow, right? Some person who came and went, and it really makes no big difference today what you do with him, although that's how people talk about him. Well, maybe he was famous and important once upon a time, but he's not here now, okay? As for this Jesus person, we don't know what happened to him, right? It's time for us to forget about him, uh, move on and make a new God for ourselves. No. He's the one you have to listen to. He didn't just relay words from God. He is the word of God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you can't just say, I don't know whatever happened to him. It doesn't matter. And, and like a, cook up a different God that you prefer. But that is what people do, and that's what they've constantly done because something's wrong in their heart. Okay, this Jesus fellow, who needs him? And they set him aside and all the things that he did to redeem us, and they say, no, we'd rather be slaves than free. We prefer the pleasures of this life, enough of this wilderness journey. I don't want any more of this wilderness journey stuff, right? And it's the most tragic foolish mistake that men and women can make to write off Jesus as no longer important and choose the world instead. Is that you? Is that what you're doing? Because it's a terrible, tragic, and foolish mistake. Because the whole Bible history points to Jesus. Jesus and nobody else. He's the one who was to come, he did come, and he will come. And all creation is going to belong to him, and there is no other name in which to receive life. You must listen to him. Every other Bible person would tell you, you need to listen to him. If you haven't been listening to him up till now, then now is the time to begin. Open up your ears. And if you have been following him, but you're losing sight of your destination, uh, you're thinking about maybe turning back, you're feeling the pull of sin, okay, again I will say, listen to Jesus Christ, listen more closely. I am the way. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's worship the Lord Jesus Christ and thank him. Lord Jesus, you are our blessed Savior. You are the greatest one who ever was. Lord Jesus, we worship 
you and thank you. And Heavenly Father, thank you for so clearly showing us our Savior. Thank you for how you have provided a, a way for us to remove all doubt that it is he. He is the one who was to come. He's the one who will come. And cause us, Lord, to be firm in our faith, to know um, this is indeed the hand of God that has done all these things. You've sent your Son. You've laid our iniquities upon him. You've put our sins away. And you have raised him from the dead to live forevermore and to be our glorious King and our Savior. And uh, so, Father, we worship you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would continue your good work in our hearts, making us strong disciples, confident and wise, uh, ready, Lord, to share this good news as uh, we have seen Stephen do and so many others to, to preach uh, the eternal word of life, Lord, that you have entrusted to us. Bless my brothers and sisters, I pray, as we uh, go our separate ways this morning. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right, saints.